Hello, Mian. Do you hear me? Hi. Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good morning. So, uh, let me introduce uh, Mian Usman is uh, Geo Network Architect and uh, will inform you about the network uh, Geo Network Evolution. So, Mian, please start with your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, and my name is Mia Osman. Uh, I am a network architect at Giant, and I will be going through uh, the Giant network overview and our network evolution plans uh, for over the next three to four years. First, to, to start off, I just wanted to give you a brief information on what Giant is. Um, uh, Giant is a, uh, we run a membership organization, Association for European National Research and Education Network. We also coordinate and participate in the EC-funded project, uh, namely the GIANT project. Uh, we also operate the pan-European e-infrastructure, the network itself called the GIANT network, and we manage the portfolio of uh, services for research and education, uh, EduRoam, uh, some, some of you might already be connected to, to that, uh, EduGain, etc. And then we also organize and run community events and working group, a TNC being one of the biggest uh, networking conference in, in the Europe for RNE networks. And then there are several different task force and special interest groups. Member, as I mentioned, we are a membership organization along with the, uh, which represent over 40 uh, European entrants. Uh, together with the entrants, uh, we support over uh, 10,000 institutions and connect about 50 million academic users. Uh, and and the, here's a list of all the, uh, the members that's not being, being here. Now, the network. So, GN Network interconnects research and education network uh, in Europe. And not only in Europe, we also have a connection all across the world, as you can see from this map, uh, going to North America, uh, Latin America, Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. Uh, so, uh, we, we have uh, several reciprocal links with our uh, partner networks. Across the Atlantic, we are a member of a partnership called ANA, where uh, advanced North Atlantic links, uh, where we have several hundred gigs of capacity. Uh, so not only we provide connectivity uh, within Europe, but through our partner networks where, with high-speed connectivity, we provide a really uh, high-speed uh, and lossless network connectivity to research, uh, researchers across uh, the globe. Uh, uh, here's an example of uh, the, the networks that the RNE, uh, the benefit of the RNE networks. We did some uh, data transfer tests in 2017 uh, between a 10 gig servers in Giant and in the Australian networks, RNET, and we managed to achieve about 9.73 gigabits per second over a 48 hour period uh, over these RNE networks. Whereas when we did the same test on the commercial networks, we only managed to achieve 1.77 gigabits per second and that, even that for only a few minutes before the traffic was dropped. So that, that's the, uh, the benefit of all the RNE networks uh, working together uh, and bringing a high-speed network uh, to, to these researchers. Now, quickly covering the network services, uh, we have uh, several different uh, services that we run. Uh, for network services, I'm going to cover just the network services. So Giant IP is the high-performance uncontented IP connectivity, uh, which is uh, at up to 100 gigabits per second. Um, several NRANs are now connected at two times 100 gigabit per second. Uh, we also support and provide uh, Giant VPN service. This is layer three, layer two VPN services to the NRANs and to the big science users, so CERN being, or LHC rather, being one of the big users for layer three VPN service, uh, which we call LHC1. We also have a GN point-to-point -point service, which is a high performance dedicated connectivity, um, up to 100 gigabits per second uh, across Europe. And we also have a service called Giant Open. This is a Giant Open Exchange, uh, which allows NRINs and approved commercial organizations to exchange connectivity uh, in a, a highly uh, efficient manner. Uh, we currently have one in Paris and in London. Several NRINs are connected and several international links terminate there. 
Ganaju Rome, as I mentioned before, which provides Wi-Fi access uh, around the world, seamless Wi-Fi access. Uh, here's a, 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 got a quick overview of the target. So we have uh, availability targets for this, this group. Dark green region uh, are five nines, 99.999 percent. That's mainly because we run our own fiber in that region. Uh, then we have uh, uh, four nines in, in a lighter uh, green uh, where we have least capacity and then four hours per month uh, downtime for the regions where we have a single connection and that is going to improve as we uh, further uh, get the uh, fiber connectivity procure fiber connectivity and I'll go through that in more detail in next few slides now just quickly showing you the GN network topology this is our main network uh, and you can see here this this is where all we have our our routers uh, is uh, Prague, uh, and and we right now in the western ring we have quite um, a, a, a lot of traffic, and that ring is at two times 100 gig here, and then the green links are, are uh, 100 gig. Uh, we have uh, several 60 gigs links. Uh, so a lot of this, all the services that are layer two or layer three are provided on the Juniper MX platform. This network is based on Juniper MX platform. So all the layer two and layer three services are provided on this layer. And I'll go over the, the traffic stats in next uh, few slides. GN point to point, uh, 10 gig and 100 gig Lambda service is provided on the Infinera network where we have our own fiber. Uh, and GN network itself, also makes use of GN DWDM network for its core network. Where we have fiber, we use our own DWDM network to light these links up. And now quickly going over the network capacity and growth. Uh, so here's a uh, data growth for the last four years. So you can see from Q1, about 230 petabyte per quarter to uh, almost 750 petabyte per quarter we've moved. Move. That's three times growth in uh, four years. Uh, that's quite significant. Uh, we've uh, received 2.4 exabyte of data in 2018. That's about 30% growth uh, on uh, from 2017. The longer term trend, we also see 30% uh, growth, uh, growth on our IP uh, MPLS layer. Here's the uh, graph which shows uh, petabyte per, per year. So from 2015, about 1,000 to 2018, we've gone about uh, nearly uh, 2,500 uh, petabyte per year. Uh, that graph isn't shown properly. So this was uh, to show uh, the um, uh, the traffic distribution. I'm not sure why it's not showing here. Uh, that so I'm going to skip that slide. Uh, move to this one. Uh, so that, uh, that that was a very quick overview of the GI network. What we have today. Now, what are the challenges? So, so as I mentioned in um, my last slide, we have to support exponential bandwidth increase. We are seeing significant traffic increase. Uh, and the traffic is highly unpredictable as well. Uh, it's research traffic. It's not traffic towards commercial network where we can see the curves. Uh, in the morning, it starts, and then in the evening, it goes down. We have very unpredictable traffic where researchers come in and starts transferring terabytes of data. Uh, so we cannot. Uh, really design the network as other commercial networks do. We need to support the r &E traffic. We need to plan uh, and, and evolve our network based on that. Also have to do the cost optimization for backbone links. What that, what, what that means is based on the historical growth, we can forecast the, the network traffic growth in the next few years. And based on that, we see that we'll need to upgrade our backbone significantly more than what we have today. Uh, and, and we, to keep adding more links into into this, uh, it's quite uh, 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 costly. So we have to find a way to reduce that cost and make it cost effective for us to upgrade the links. We also want to uh, improve network visibility. Uh, we're working on streaming telemetry so we can gather more visibility and anal analytical data so we can control operational costs. The more data we have, the more visibility we have of the network, uh, then um, the more it helps us in improving it. So we're working to, to, that's one of the challenges to get that data and visibility. 
Uh, we've also in Jan for three project focused on uh, several SDN applications. So we want to offer uh, programmability, so ability to use uh, APIs to link applications to network, uh, increasing agility and speed of the service de deployment. So one of the service that has been developed in Jan for three is uh, consolidated connection services, which uses Open NSA, for example, which provides uh, APIs uh, to link applications to the network and provision circuits across the network. We also have a challenge of dependence on a single vendor uh, where both the hardware and software are provided by the vendor, uh, single vendor, and if we change more hardware, we'll have to change all the, the software components and all the business application and operational application that are using that uh, uh, software. And the uh, last one, uh, but not the least, is the short funding cycles that, that we had in the past where we would only get money for about uh, seven to eight years funding for IIU. That has been, not, uh, that cost a lot of uh, problems, obviously, because the, the cost of change is quite high when you have to go out there and procure several uh, fiber routes uh, every seven to eight years and then go and change the line system. So that has been fixed by a new stream of EC funding, and I'll be going through that in, in, in a couple of slides. So I'm going to go through uh, different layers of the network uh, in the next slide. So I'll start with fiber, and then we'll go on to the line system, and then the packet layer, and then network management layer. So just quickly starting with the fiber network. Uh, this is the diagram of our current fiber network. Um, uh, these are, again, short-term leases, about seven to eight years, 10 years. Uh, and here, uh, the blue links are our own on procure fiber, where we have uh, procured fiber and we light it using Infinera uh, optical equipment. Currently, 14 countries are connected on the fiber network, and you can see Czech Republic here. We have two link, uh, fiber links going out of there, one towards Frankfurt and one towards uh, Bratislava, which then goes on to Vienna and Budapest. Uh, You'll notice that there is a just a yellow line from Hamburg to, to Amsterdam. Uh, in this, uh, we are uh, on this link. We are spectrum sharing with SafeNet and NodeNet. Uh, we had our own fiber on this route, and SafeNet uh, had the fiber as well. Uh, we terminated our fiber and started using uh, sharing this with uh, uh, SafeNet and NodeNet, and that has reduced our cost by two thirds. Not only ours, but also SafeNets and, and NodeNet. So. Uh, we, we're also looking at more of infrastructure sharing, where the infrastructure already exists. Uh, we're planning on, on using that. Uh, so, so this is the, the main core fiber, but where we don't have fiber, uh, we use uh, um, leased capacity or cross-border fiber to pr provide connectivity between those countries. So, for example, in Portugal, we have uh, connectivity from Lisbon to Madrid, which is a cross-border fiber provided by the Spanish NREN and the Portuguese NREN. Uh, so we use their own existing infrastructure where possible. And then the second backup link out of Lisbon is provided uh, by a commercial uh, provider. So how do we, uh, this, this was our, our current, uh, this is our current network and uh, starting point of our fiber renewal plan. plan. Uh, I mentioned earlier about the new funding stream. So we, we, we and we got an IIU uh, uh, SGA from EC, so they created a vehicle for us to procure uh, this fiber infrastructure on the long-term contracts, and uh, that is 100% funded. Uh, we, uh, the goal for that is to procure the long-term IIUs and the associated equipment. In this case, it will be the line system, so it is easier for us to light that fiber and utilize it. The aim of that is to uh, decrease the digital divide between uh, in, uh, in, the, in Europe and reduce the, uh, the, the cost, uh, and also be, be able to provide high capacity network across Europe. Uh, so I'll go through the next few slides. I'll, I'll show you how we actually uh, planned uh, for the next uh, fiber network uh, and, and how we've kind of uh, gone through different stages of planning, and then I'll finally show you the, the map for the new fiber. So first off, we started with setting up different regional study groups. So what are the regional study groups? The aim of the regional study group is to uh, involve the local NRINs so that they provide their connectivity requirements for the future. 
and they can also bring in their local market knowledge uh, about the connectivity that is available in the region, which we may not be familiar with. Uh, so we set a five regional study group. Here's the, the, the quick, uh, list of what uh, regional study groups there were. And they were led by several different uh, NRUNs as well. Several NRUNs were involved at the end. They all produced a short uh, a, a report of, on the, how the connectivity in the region should look like based on the connectivity requirements of the NRUNs in the region and their local knowledge of what's available in that region. And then we, we used that um, uh, information. Uh, we had obviously, a, a, an earlier I showed our own traffic uh, graph. So we knew from historic traffic, we could forecast what the traffic would look like in different regions. But then regional studies provided us even more of in a view of what we could expect in future, because that input came directly from the environs and the, the, the regional environs. Uh, so uh, that information along with the technology strategy, so how we light that fiber, uh, how do we deliver the service, uh, which I will be covering that, uh, the technology strategy part in the next few slides. First, I'll cover this fiber bit. And then we organized uh, community engagement and workshops to share those results uh, with the community so we can share the, the brief plans uh, very early on and get the feedback from the community. And obviously, we get the feedback from the community, and we we go to the next stop. So, how does that that how much does that cost? So, we had uh, input from the regional studies, and we had our own traffic projection. Uh, based on that, we could design a network. But then we had to figure out how much is it going to cost us to deliver that network. So, we looked at equipment cost based on the technology strategy. So, what equipment are we going to use? Uh, I mentioned infrastructure bef sharing before, so we looked at, uh, we worked with the NRUNs to get offers from the NRUNs for infrastructure sharing, so how much will it cost us to share their existing infrastructure? Uh, and then we also carried out the market RFI, uh, which resulted in uh, receiving over 100, uh, um, uh, the prices for over 100 uh, different links from the commercial market. That then we had to kind of verify and, uh, and look at how we can achieve a desirable outcome with, based on the constraints that we have, what kind of network we need and how much it is going to cost. Uh, that then kind of gave us the, the network blueprint, uh, blueprint, but at every level we engaged with the community. We had a different regional study uh, uh, workshops. We had CTO workshops where we had to uh, get kind of consensus, build consensus between the entrants. So based on all of that stakeholder reviews, financial constraints, and the input from the community, we came up with the network blueprint and IIU budget, and here is that outcome for, for that. Uh, this is kind of a straw man approved at Giant uh, General Assembly in June 2018, and you can see here that the connectivity have increased significantly. Uh, the fiber connectivity, it's gone from um, connecting 14 countries to 24 countries. Uh, here you can see, for example, I earlier gave you an uh, example of Czech Republic. So we had two fiber links, one going to Frankfurt, the other one going towards Bratislava. Uh, in this case, there will be three fiber links going out of Prague, for example. Uh, this is, again, just a straw man. Uh, the map may change, but this is kind of a, what we, uh, the community and us, we work together. Uh, we think that's a feasible network for us within the investment uh, that we'll have about a 48 million euros. And this is again all based on the, uh, the regional uh, study uh, uh, outcomes. And you'll see uh, there is a lot more of these uh, orange lines because then we're doing a lot more infrastructure sharing than we were doing uh, in the past. So we'll have uh, a shared infrastructure from Poznan uh, to this Baltic ring, which connects to, to this, uh, create this Baltic ring on, the, on fiber. Uh, we'll also have uh, from Amsterdam, uh, Brussels, Paris, uh, uh, a lot of the, the fibers, existing fiber will share uh, to reduce the cost and use the infrastructure from the environment. <clears throat> okay, so, what is the impact of, of that uh, on the uh, operation and maintenance cost of the uh, of Giant? Uh, so here we are now in January 2019, 
and this is our annual uh, OEM recurring cost in a million euros. So we've current cost is just above six million euros, and the fiber cost is here, which is about nearly two and a half million euro. Uh, we'll be doing procurement in 2019, and we believe that uh, early in 2020. We'll be able to quickly move some of the existing fiber uh, contract to the new contract. And that will reduce the cost significantly for us. And the new fiber cost will be this lighter green one. Uh, and slowly we'll be able to uh, r remove all of the existing fibers and move to the new contracts. And you can see uh, the existing 14 fiber route, uh, 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 existing fiber route which connects 14 uh, countries, cost of that is about two and a half million euros. But the new way we connect about uh, uh, 24 countries to the fiber, that's nearly uh, less lower than that. Uh, and overall, obviously, when we replace the uh, the line system, we use the DCIs and the new routers, etc. That will also reduce the cost. So we are going from, from here towards uh, downwards by uh, October 2022, mainly because we're not only changing the fibers, but how do we then light that infrastructure? How do we uh, make it cost effective for us to use that fiber infrastructure that we're just securing? I'll be going through that in the next few slides that uh, that then it'll explain uh, a little more. So we'll be, uh, we don't just want to procure the fiber and use the existing equipment, which is again, quite costly. So we have to look at uh, redefining the existing architecture and equipment that we use. So I'll go through that now. So we, we started looking at the, the network evolution of the, the, the platform itself. So, uh, as I've shown in the last few slides, uh, we've got a funding for the fiber, so we are uh, getting a, a more uh, fiber footprint in Europe. So we had to look at the ways to reduce our cost. Uh, and uh, we wanted to, uh, again, one of the challenges that I mentioned in earlier on slide was uh, the uh, vendor lock-in, and we wanted to move towards a vendor and technology or agnostic architecture, uh, disaggregation. So we, we looked at uh, the industry trends. One of the big trends was disaggregation, so decouple the innovation cycle, and which helps accelerate the innovation. So we, we want to enable GN to use best-in-class solution at different layers uh, and decrease the dependence on a single vendor. We also wanted to increase options for entrants to connect to uh, from a different platform. Right now, there are only two options for entrants to connect. One is they connect to us at Infinera OTN layer, or they connect to it at Juniper MX layer. So we wanted to uh, optimize that. We also wanted to reduce space and power requirement because right now we have big chassis uh, equipment. They use a lot of power and space, uh, require quite a lot of space. Uh, so by allowing the smaller form factor, we'd overcome that space and power requirement. And again, you'll see in the next few slides how we uh, managed to do that. And again, open and disaggregated architecture allows us to evolve and, and, and to differentiate ourselves from the commercial providers uh, so we can further develop uh, the services that the RE users need for, for, from the network. So we, we, what we did was we obviously had to do a lot of planning work. We had to model the network, analyze the network, uh, different layers of the network at component levels. We did that for the, the optical layer, and you'll see that in the next slide. Uh, so we, we wanted to understand the impact of the growth on cost. So uh, I, as I mentioned before, we have the historical data for the traffic growth. Based on that, we forecasted the, the growth in future. So what is the impact of that growth on our cost? If we don't change, we did that, and we looked at how we could improve that, optimize that, uh, and, and then we uh, found the solution for it. Uh, we also wanted to look at different technical choices available to us uh, from both technical and financial perspective. Uh, and and it, it gives us more uh, transparent decision making. All these planning or get, getting all this data then helps us uh, improve and review this uh, in future. So here's a, a quick look at the optical transport layer. So right now we are at, uh, we currently use Infinera um, optical layer, uh, equipment, DTNX. It's a vertically integrated single vendor solution. What that means is that the hardware, uh, it's a big chassis provided by Infinera, and then it, there's a vendor proprietary network controller, uh, Infinera uh, DNA. Uh, 
the connectivity between the two, uh, it's again proprietary and closed APIs. It's very vendor specific data models. So if, we, if there was another software in the market that was available, uh, it had feature we needed, we couldn't use it with this. It's very closed system. So uh, we looked at how we can um, use that disaggregation that um, industry is, is using and how we can trans, uh, uh, evolve our optical network into this disaggregated open optical line system. So what we've done is uh, we've planned to procure open line system uh, in uh, this year. So the, the tender will be issued this year. We'll have open line system. And we've already procured the data center that connects the Korean groove, uh, which we'll be using on, on top of existing Infinera, but in future it'll be on, based on open line system. What that gives us is uh, obviously the flexibility to use any new DCI equipment or transponding equipment when it becomes available. Uh, for example, if the existing vendor is late in bringing up 400 gigabit or, or one terabit and the new vendor does bring it in, we can buy that equipment and use it with the existing, uh, with the, the new open line system. It also, uh, we're also focused on the uh, data models and uh, openness of these optical systems uh, and the NMSs. And as you can see, we are looking at this uh, in a multi-vendor disaggregated solution. We already moved towards that. I'll be showing you in next uh, slide the impact of uh, us moving to the DCI to upgrade it. So here's the, the slide which shows the, the impact of um, uh, looking at the data that I mentioned before. So what is the impact of growth uh, on our costs uh, using the existing equipment or using the new equipment? So if we were to support the forecasted traffic growth on the existing infrared equipment, the cost will, are shown in this orange line. As you can see, over the next uh, four years, there will be uh, over 7 million euros if we just use pure infrared equipment. And when we get to replace our infrared in future to open line system, all that investment is gone because those interfaces were very uh, specifically just for that infrared equipment. So what we looked at is if we uh, buy DCI boxes, then what is our cost? So here's the green line which is showing if we uh, buy DCIs, and then uh, use them with Infinera. The cost, the same, to upgrade the same link as, as this one is just over 3 million euros. That's less than uh, half of the, the cost for, for that. Uh, so we've decided to, to buy DCIs, uh, and here's a timeline of what we've done. So we've, we've kind of moving from this monolithic block of Infinera equipment to this open and disaggregated optical layer in GN network. So we procured DCI equipment, as I mentioned, Korean Groove uh, when we bought them, but now they're called Infrera Groove because Infrera bought the company. Uh, and uh, but we, we've got those um, in the in the network now. Um, it significantly reduces the cost of upgrading the giant backbone link. Uh, again, it's a small box, so it also significantly reduces a space and power requirement. And again, it protects giant's investment because we are able to reuse those DCIs with the next generation of optical line system and we procure it. Uh, and, and here's a, a brief kind of a, a, a timeline of what, where we, what we've done. So we met different vendors, we then trialed Facebook Voyager box in lab and then field trial. Then we tested different DCI equipment in the lab and field trial. Uh, based on that, we then were able to write technical specification for DCI procurement. And then we, uh, we launched the procurement early last year and we concluded the DCI procurement. Uh, last year, uh, in 2018, uh, we've actually started deploying uh, the boxes and we are right now at the deploy DCI stage. Uh, this year, we'll launch the open line system procurement and then for the next two, uh, three years, we'll be uh, deploying the open line system to fully move towards that open disaggregated uh, line system uh, um, uh, as I mentioned before. So here's uh, the phase one of uh, the line, uh, DCI de uh, deployment. Uh, we've already com completed this uh, London 1 and London 2, and here's what we are hoping to do to complete in the next few uh, months. Uh, so all the Western Ring links, uh, instead of adding more capacity on the Infinera, we'll be adding it um, in the 
uh, on the DCI, so it reduces our cost of upgrading uh, the links. And then in 2020 and later on 2019, we'll be uh, adding more of these DCI boxes across network where, wherever it's needed. Now quickly moving to, on to the, the, the packet layer. So packet layer is currently uh, based on the, um, oh, sorry, the, out, the, the PowerPoint just uh, decided to restart. Let me just quickly start my presentation again. Uh, where was I? Can you see my screen? Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. So I'll just quickly start. Um, okay, so open, now going moving to from the, the, the transport layer onto the, the packet layer. We currently have, as I mentioned before, the packet layer based on Juniper MX platform. Uh, again, the, the management system is also provided by Juniper, uh, Juno Space. So we wanted to look at how we uh, find, how can we find a cost-effective solution to uh, this existing uh, equipment that we have? So we looked at different solutions. So one of them was uh, a disaggregation uh, solution where we use a white box uh, solution uh, uh, based on commodity hardware, uh, and then we get a, a network operating system or protocol stack from somewhere else, a commercial provider or open source, and then we use uh, different uh, management frameworks for that. Uh, we trialed and tested that with several different vendors. Uh, the software vendors include IPNC and Metaswitch, uh, and hardware was Corsa, Dell, Ajima, but it wasn't uh, fit for operation, so it wasn't considered as operationally feasible, so we, uh, we didn't go with that solution. We also looked at several other vendor solutions. We looked at Arista, uh, we, uh, different Arista boxes, and we also looked at the the Juniper uh, alternative uh, from Juniper boxes. Now, uh, I'll just quickly go to the slides, yes. So, as I mentioned, we investigated different solutions. So, this result of that was that incumbent vendors also respond to that changing market condition. So, they also came up with a cost-effective small device that we were looking for. Uh, so, we've... Uh, uh, procured MX204s, uh, which are small 1U form factor to replace some of the routers in GN network. Uh, and the reason we've selected those is there is a low cost of change as there is no integration weight required. We already are using Juniper. We are just moving from big boxes to smaller ones only in the locations where we don't need the, the, the big boxes. So there is no forklift migration. Uh, also, uh, fewer skills to learn for uh, operations and knock teams. Uh, and then uh, introduction, to the, the, one of the big one is that the introduction of MX204, where we are uh, in 14, uh, we're replacing 14 MX480s, uh, a power consumption in those locations uh, for the Juniper router reduces by 66% and our yearly maintenance cost goes down by about 79%. So that's significant for us, and it's a quick change, so we're looking at that. It doesn't mean that in future we won't be looking at other vendors, it's just that uh, it was a quick win for us, and we had to uh, upgrade some of the, we replace some of the MPCs, uh, and it cost us less to buy MX204 than to buy the, the hardware for the existing platforms in, the, in those locations. Here's a quick timeline of uh, what we've kind of done so far. Uh, again, as I mentioned, we've tested we with Metaswitch and Corsa. Uh, we worked with Dell, Arista, Gma for testing. So we've tested a lot of the uh, the, uh, the solutions. Uh, here is the um, uh, the photo of MX204. Uh, this is what it looks like. Again, as I mentioned, it reduces our operational cost and and power significantly. Uh, it's, it's only for small pops, of course, we cannot replace it in the locations, for example, in Western Europe, uh, where we have three times 100 gig backbone links. So this will be for smaller pops, uh, uh, where we don't have that much of a requirement, Ljubljana and uh, Zagreb, uh, et cetera. And the deployment is currently planned for second quarter of 2019. So we'll, we'll replace about 14 MX480s with MX204s. Now, just quickly kind of recapping on the, the, the what we've discussed in this uh, slide, which has quite a lot of animation and is quite monocolor, but this is currently showing 
what we have right now. So we we have dark fiber in, in, in some locations where we use infrared equipment to light that dark fiber, and then we use that to connect our Juniper MX routers together. Uh, where we don't have our own dark fiber, we have leased capacity, and we use that to connect to Juniper MX 960s together. And Enrens, as I mentioned before, have uh, two ways to connect uh, to Giant and get those services. One is connecting via uh, connecting to Infinera, and one is via Juniper MX 960s. Now, all the changes that I mentioned, how do these impact the, uh, the architecture? Uh, here is the first one. Um, so all the new interconnections will be based on the DCI equipment, so we don't invest any more money on the Infinera OTN layer, which is quite cost, uh, costly. So we are saving money by quickly moving towards the Korean DCI. Again, low, low, low capex and reduced opex, and it has low space and power requirements. So quite a, a significant uh, outcome for us. And then I mentioned MX204. So we are replacing some of the uh, Juniper MX480s with MX204s. Uh, that is uh, on 14 different uh, uh, MX480s will be replaced with 204. That reduces the cost again. Uh, as I mentioned before, 66% reduction in power in those locations and 70% reduction in maintenance. That's quite significant again. And then we'll, uh, in 2019, we're looking to procure open line system uh, and we'll be deploying that in the next few years. So that uh, then removes the expensive OTN layer and uh, all the links can go through Korean DCIs, which we've, and as I mentioned, I've, I've already started to deploy. So that's again, uh, where I mentioned protecting our investment. So all the DCIs that we are buying now will be used with the new line system as well. So that way we, we can keep using our uh, existing infrastructure. So this, uh, in, in future, obviously, we've got, right now we're replacing MX 480s and then keeping MX 960s, but we do realize that in, this is a short-term uh, solution for uh, maybe get us through to 2020, 2021. We still need to look at simplifying the packet layer. So we're looking at different uh, packet code devices and edge devices. We'll continue that investigation so we can simplify this packet layer uh, further. This uh, optical uh, layer, as I mentioned before, becomes a, a very vendor agnostic optical layer for us because it's based on a technology which is open line system and DCI's external transponders. We are not tied down to any vendor. It could be any vendor that, that can provide that equipment. The, the, it just needs to be technology compatible with each other. And what that, that does for, for what that means for NRENs is that increases our options uh, to connect NRENs at different uh, layers. So we are currently working uh, in Gen 4 3 to develop uh, a spectrum as a service where NRENs will be able to connect directly to the open line system. Where NRENs need uh, a capacity connectivity between the two sites, we, they can also be connected using DCIs. Uh, they can also be connected to packet call uh, devices if they just need a simple uh, IP devices. And if they need more advanced services, then we're looking at edge devices. So and also the architectural impact of all the work that we're doing in evolving the network is that it increases the options for NRENs for connectivity, and it helps us optimize the cost. So uh, we don't just connect them to the highest or the most expensive layer, we connect the NRENs to the most appropriate layer possible, where they can get the functionality that they need in the most cost-effective way. Now, management and software, we're looking at uh, the, the network automation work. Uh, we've, we've looked at network configuration automation and change management, so significant work has been carried out on that, and I've got just uh, the two slides uh, after this to show you to show you that we're also looking at orchestration because we're moving towards a very uh, multi-vendor environment. Uh, so we're looking, we're engaging with several vendors to trial their product, uh, Sienna Blue Planet, Juniper, uh, uh, Juniper's uh, PC, uh, and uh, not start. Uh, so we started from, from here, orchestration, and then eventually the long-term goal is to, to move towards a policy-based automation of configuration, which then enables users uh, to kind of uh, run that intent and network configuration, uh, bring their intent and uh, network configuration in sync. Now, just quickly, I'll mention what we've done in, in terms of automation. Uh, so we've uh, developed uh, kind of, uh, automation scriptings uh, where we do Juno's code certification and benchmarking and qualification using scripts. Uh, it 
the impact of that is that we haven't introduced any service effective bug in the network for the last four years. And the type testing of Junos used to take us about six, four to six months. We used to find a lot, manually do all the configuration, find those bugs, but now we, we run it overnight tests. Uh, find the, the uh, whatever uh, vulnerabilities we find, we report it back to Junos and we know Juniper and we know that this is not suitable for us. Uh, and that's how we, we kind of reduce the time it takes uh, for, for us to do the testing. We've actually saved about three man months per iteration of Juno. So every time we had to replace, uh, upgrade a Juno's version, um, we were spending about three man months on, uh, three to four man months on uh, testing and qualifying that uh, code. So now we don't have to, to do that. Uh, the way we do it, again, uh, we test all the expected behavior through a series of tests. We troubleshoot if there is any problem, we'll repeat the, the test until all of them are passed and then certify for the code for the network release uh, into the network. So it's very automated way for us to do it uh, and, and has worked very well for us now. Optical lab automation, again, we have to do a lot of testing for the, uh, the, the optical equipment as well. We, um, as I mentioned, we are moving towards this disaggregated open optical line system. We are testing different uh, DCI equipment and open line systems. So those tests have also been automated. So script, scripting has allowed us to, to read all the parameters. So we run those scripts and hundreds of tests are run overnight for us to kind of then come back in the morning and look at it and go, okay, this works for us or this doesn't work for us. And my colleague, Guy Roberts, uh, worked on that uh, to create and it quite uh, helps us to test new optical equipment as well. That's in the Cambridge lab, by the way. So just to quickly summarize and wrap up, we've kind of uh, got a plan for we've, we've got a plan for the replacement of uh, the existing Gen Fiber network with Fiber Renewal Plan. I shared with you that plan earlier on. Uh, that is uh, based on the input from the community. We've also got the evolution plan for the architecture that is based on the uh, evolving the existing platform and using. Um, newer platforms to deliver uh, the same level of services, but in a cost-effective way. I, I showed you different cost modeling and long-term financial forecasting that we've done. Uh, that actually has helped a lot in setting up the technical strategy, which equipment to use and how to use it. Uh, and then forecasting uh, also helped with the fiber renewal plan uh, I shared before. And we continue to do the technology assessment, so we'll develop the plan for how the new net network infrastructure can be used in GN network, again, to help the NRENs in the community uh, in much more uh, cost-effective way and provide more functionality, more capacity uh, uh, to, to the NRENs. And this is it from me. Thank you very much for listening. Are there any questions? So any questions or comment? If not, uh, Mian, thank you very much for your presentation and for your time, and have a nice day. Thank you very much. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day and conference. Thank you. Bye.